Let me ask you, first of all, any problems with the election Tuesday? You know, there are always some minor things here and there. It's really just because of the scope of the operation. If you think about over 3,000 polling locations staffed by close to 30,000 patriotic Ohioans, Republicans and Democrats. So, you know, we had a, uh, a concerning incident that happened in Toledo. Thankfully, uh, law enforcement was able to uh, to move in quite quickly and, and, and get that. We had, I think, one or two power outages at places. We, we had all those things. But because of the, the operation that we've put in place, we're now able at the Secretary of State's office to sort of quickly identify those issues, triage what's high priority and what's not, and then really quickly react to things. So that's a, a new capacity that we have with uh, with the work that we do at the Secretary of State's office to really make sure that we're helping our county boards of elections coordinate everything that goes on that day. Yeah, I was reading about that situation in Toledo. It was kind of scary. Can you talk about a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So, and from what we know, and we were getting reports in our sort of war room operation there at the Secretary of State's office that um, an individual who was uh, angry, um, came in and, and was making threatening comments uh, involving a firearm and, and this kind of thing, uh, of course, the Toledo police and the you know Lucas County Sheriff's Department and all the other law enforcement entities very quickly uh, you know got involved in the situation. Turned out that this individual evidently had some prior warrants and, and has a track record of, of doing the wrong thing and uh, has now been charged with a, with a felony as a result of it. This is something that we do not um, take lightly. Uh, the safety of our voters, the safety of our poll workers, and the continuity of the operations are absolutely crucial on Election Day. And so the good news is all the plans that we had in place to deal with those kind of things uh, worked quite smoothly. Speaking of poll workers, you ended up getting enough poll yeah. workers and that ended up not being a problem. But it seems like every election, it's, it's hard to get poll workers. Yeah. You're out there trying to get them. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen to get more poll workers and get as stable of them that is, you know, continuously can be there. So really, this is a, a good news story. I was concerned because August 2nd is not a normal day when people think about working as a poll worker or being a voter for that matter. So we really rolled up our sleeves with the county boards of elections as soon as we knew we were unfortunately going to have to have this August 2nd election. And um, we, we had these five recruiting programs that initially started in 2020. Um, and those were all put into place. We, we were able to recruit lawyers to get continuing ed credits for being a poll worker. Realtors were doing the same. Uh, a lot of other professional organizations. Uh, veterans groups were answering what I called a second call to duty by, by serving as a poll worker. We had a lot of high school students that signed up as part of our Youth at the Booth program. So really, in that sense, um, by within three or four days before Election Day, we had every poll worker that we needed. We were ready to go, but we never rest on that. We're already recruiting poll workers for November. And anybody that wants to be part of that important uh, uh, activity could sign up at VoteOhio.gov. Now, you ask about things that we can do. Uh, people raise the issue of pay. It's important that we pay poll workers adequately. It varies by county. Um, there's always room to, to, to improve that. I don't really think that's the chief motivation for people that, that do it, but it's important that we pay them. There's something else that has been talked about over the years about, well, could it be a split shift? Um, could you have you know one crew in the morning and another crew in the afternoon? Certainly open to that, but I know that concerns our elections officials because it's already hard to recruit 40,000 poll workers. Now imagine having to recruit 80,000 because as soon as you allow those split shifts, then and that would require a change in law, sir certainly to do that. But Ohioans have stepped up, answered the call. It's a it's a great thing, uh, not only from the standpoint of having enough people to do it, but also creating an army of truth tellers, right? Because what we're talking about is men and women, Republicans and Democrats in each community around Ohio that have actually taken the time to know how elections work, to understand why a lot of those conspiracy theories just don't hold up to the facts. And, and each of those individuals is then empowered to help spread the word in their community. So in that sense, I think it's really good to sign up uh, poll workers as well because, again, they become that army of, of, of truth tellers out there in the community that can help people know why I say it's both easy to vote and hard to cheat in Ohio. Low turnout, more than seven, less than eight. Were you surprised by that? Uh, not surprised. Yes, disappointed, right? We, we all in elections administration, Republicans and Democrats want to see high turnout. It's something that we work very hard at. If you were to ask the men and women at your board of elections, uh, they, they want to see the highest turnout possible. We work very hard to run elections and we know that 
uh, democracy works best when the diverse voices of Ohioans can be heard in large numbers. That means high levels of participation. Um, certainly, Ohio makes it easy, so it's not a matter of convenience. We have four weeks of early voting, four weeks of absentee voting. We have long hours, longer than many other states, 6.30 a.m. till 7.30 p.m., so we make it easy to vote. Um, Primaries can be hard in general, right? Every primary is different. Some primaries uh, have uh, feature a, a big top of the ticket race where there's been millions of dollars of ad spending and other primaries there, there aren't. So it's hard to make an apples to apples comparison. And certainly this was a really unusual primary. It, it just, it was not like anything that we've ever seen before. It was really kind of half a primary, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so we expected uh, that there could be low turnout. We worked hard to try to avert that, but in the end, uh, Ohioans uh, did didn't, didn't show up at the large numbers that we'd like to see, but we did have a free and fair election. Because of redistricting snafus, there was that second primary this mm -hmm. summer. It cost $25 million, maybe even a little more than that. Uh, given the low turnout, was it worth it? Well, I tell you what, it's um, not an option not to have an election. And Ohioans deserve to have the chance to nominate their party's candidates for the November ballot. Ohioans have the chance to choose their party's leadership for their the state center committee, both Republican and Democrat. Um, listen, it was um, really unfortunate that we were put in this situation. I think you know that I was ringing the alarm bell uh, eight, nine months ago saying we've got to get this resolved because we've got to have this election. I wanted there to be a unified election. We tried exceedingly hard to get that done. You know, in my opinion, there was a massive amount of litigation and what I consider to be some very incorrect decisions by the Ohio Supreme Court that put us in this position. I don't think anybody wanted there to be a bifurcated primary, but because of all that litigation, because of these decisions, many of which took too long, in my opinion, by the Ohio Supreme Court, we ended up with no other option. Um, does it discourage you that a lot of voters who went to vote said, hey, there wasn't much on my ballot. I kind of feel used. I didn't even care if I voted on this thing, you know, party race or something that they voted on because there wasn't much on the ballot. What does that do to the, the institution of voting? Well, first of all, I, I think that, that um, that's a, maybe a lack of understanding by some. I've been trying to make it very clear that state central committee races are enormously important. If you are concerned about about the direction of your party, Republican or, or Democratic, the way to really impact that is by who you elect to the state central committee. It is the governing body of the Ohio Republican Party and the Ohio Democratic Party. This is the body that chooses who the chairperson's gonna be, sets the budget, decides who the party's going to endorse. And so in that sense, state central committee races are enormously important. Now, unfortunately, sometimes people uh, sort of value a, a campaign by how many ads they see or how many mailings they get and, and whatever else. And it's a fact that, you know, candidates for state central committee don't have big budgets often to, to do that kind of uh, a public information effort, but it doesn't mean that it's not an important race. Nominating candidates for state rep and state senate and choosing your party's uh, leadership committee is enormously important. And so this was definitely an important election for Ohio. Okay, well, going into November, you've said mm -hmm. that the 2020 election in Ohio was legitimate. Um, President Trump called shenanigans in other states, and, and you actually said on Twitter that Trump has a point about voter fraud and mm -hmm. that the media downplayed the voter fraud. Um, that kind of sent a mixed message to the Trump base. So I'm asking you again on that 2020 election in Ohio, uh, was it valid? And is there a need in Ohio yeah. for reforms that critics say could disenfranchise voters? So let me be abundantly clear about this. Cause I think that like so many issues in public policy, people want to maybe oversimplify or make this some sort of a quick binary thing. Uh, the 2020 election in Ohio was not only a, a legitimate election, it was the best election Ohio has ever had. Every quantifiable metric you can look at tells that tale. We had a record number of voters. We had a record number of early voters and absentee voters, and, and, and we had a record number of poll workers. We were able to reduce the number of ballots that were rejected because of voter mistakes. Uh, we were able to reduce the number of provisional ballots to an all-time low. We had a record number of people even registered to vote for that election. So on every metric you could look at, Ohio ran what can only be called our most successful election in the most difficult environment we've ever faced. Ohioans also know that we have voting machines that are never connected to the internet, tested before each election. Ohioans know that it is a completely bipartisan enterprise. It takes two people to screw in a light bulb at your board of elections because you got to have a Republican and a Democrat oversee every part of that. 
that. Maybe we take that for granted in Ohio, but we shouldn't. It's not that way in every state. In many states, if you're the elected county clerk and you're a Democrat, everybody in the elections office is a Democrat. Or if you're the elected county clerk and you're a Republican, then everybody that works there is a Republican. We don't do it that way in Ohio. Then the other thing that we do is this post-election audit that is something that we do for every election, not just presidential elections, not just gubernatorial elections. In fact, in about three weeks, we're going to do it for the election that was just conducted. And that's when we count the hard copy piece of paper, the dead tree wet ink piece of paper, and we compare it to the electronic result. So we have those two parallel systems. Electronic tabulation gives us the chance to have a result on election night, which we all want. But then the post-election audit allows us to compare the two and reconcile them. But here, here's what I had to say about the 2020 election, particularly in other states. I said that President Trump is right to be concerned and to raise concerns. So are others. Republicans and Democrats should be critical of elections and looking for ways to improve, looking for ways that things can be done better. But to the extent that bad things happened in the 2020 election, it's not my opinion that they were some uh, cloak and dagger secretive operation going on. The things that happened in 2020 that should have never happened, happened in full public view. They happened largely in courtrooms where uh, a, a, a judge was convinced by some activist lawsuit to change the rules maybe just days before the election. That shouldn't happen. Uh, they happened in Secretary of State's offices where chief elections officers ignored their state's laws and engaged in what I called crisis opportunism to um, you know, change the rules without even getting the authority of their legislature to do it. It also happened in the case where uh, private philanthropic dollars were granted to election entities and then those dollars weren't used properly. To be clear, when that money flowed into Ohio, we had the legislature's permission to spend it and we spent it on boring things like hand sanitizer and masks and plexiglass shields and all these things that had to be purchased for the 2020 election to save the taxpayers dollars. But to be clear, in other places, in other jurisdictions around the country, outside of Ohio, they use those dollars to try to boost Democratic turnout. That's problematic, and that's not something that really should happen. Elections administration shouldn't uh, operate that way. So were there things that happened in 2020 that shouldn't happen? Absolutely. We learn from them. We move forward. But also, you know, the system largely worked. We had a peaceful transfer of power. Uh, we, we had, uh, you know, things uh, that, that shouldn't have happened, but we had uh, the civic institutions of our country held fast and, and, and um, you know, ultimately uh, the voters had their choice in a free and fair election. And as you just pointed out, most of those things that you just outlined happened elsewhere. They weren't yep. in Ohio. Sure. So here in Ohio, do we have a reason that, that you know, we're still hearing some of these candidates, uh, Joe Blystone, after he lost, he said, hey, you know, there was a problem here. There was some funny things going yep. on. Um, do we need more um, intervention in Ohio as far as voter reforms because there's a real problem here in Ohio to correct. Not because there's a real problem. But I'll tell you this. We run elections so well, so transparently, so that the loser knows they lost. And that may sound negative, but if you think about this, when you run an election, of course the winner is going to accept that they won. They're going to go out and give a victory speech. But you need to do it so well so transparently that the loser knows they lost. There's this magical thing that really should happen at about 10.30 p.m. on election night when the losing candidate calls the winning candidate and congratulates her. That's something that should happen, and that's why we run elections so well. Now, are there room for improvement? There always is. One of the things that I want to see us do better is list maintenance. It's something I've really leaned into. We should remove dead people from the voter rolls. We do that aggressively, but there are some data things that we could do to do it better. We should also help people get registered to vote and update their address better than we do right now. Some of those things require changes, and I've approached the legislature and asked for some of those changes. There's something that I want to work on and have worked on internally with my team, and we hope to be able to announce something soon, to do a better job of actually investigating and prosecuting election crime. Because the fact is, it is rare but we need to keep it rare. It's rare, but when it occurs, it's serious, right? And so we need to have better mechanisms for actually delivering a packet to a county prosecutor that lays out all the evidence so that they can actually secure a conviction. That's hard to do sometimes. And again, uh, voter fraud occurs. It occurs everywhere. It occurs, though, at a relatively low rate. But when it does happen, it's serious, and we need to prosecute it. So there are some things that we can do to be better. But Ohio really is viewed as a national model. I get this when I travel to Secretary of State conferences. We just got back from the National Secretary of State's conference. Others, my colleagues around the country, they look to Ohio 
as an example to follow. And that's something we can be proud of. It's intuitive why. We've been in the national spotlight for 20 years. Ohio's gotten good at this. We have professional elections administrators and good laws in place. And by the way, we fight those activist lawsuits instead of settling them because we don't want to make election law at the courthouse. We want to make it at the state house. So those are things that Ohio does well. And here's another way that it was illustrated. Just last year, the state of Pennsylvania asked me to testify in their state Senate. They knew that they had been embarrassed on the national stage by not having their logistics in place, not being able to re release those unofficial election results on election night. They asked me to speak in front of a Senate committee. I gave them seven recommendations. I'm sorry to say they haven't implemented them yet, but they view Ohio as an example to follow. That's something that all of us, Republicans and Democrats in elections administration, can be proud of. Okay, well, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Joe.